Good morning. You satisfied with that one? You want another shot? Good morning. Who felt the earth move today? Yeah, I changed my whole sermon, you know. Somebody said, you feel the earthquake? I said, I feel it every day. What are you talking about? My age, it feels like it's always wobbling. Good to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Thank you for being here. Feel free once you're seated, social distance, take your mask off. Ain't a point sitting there smothering the whole time. Good grief. If somebody says anything, tell them we're having a peaceful protest here. And we may serve communion and stand by restaurant standards, but anyway, thanks for being here today. Hey, the blood drive is going on. Um, it's going till three o'clock today in the back parking lot. You can walk into the dining center uh, if you're a walk-in or you can stop by, I think, in the foyer and schedule an appointment. And they'll be here till three. We've had a great response, but if you didn't sign up, you'd like to give, be a great time to do that. There are, there are six buses going to be here to make sure that we can accommodate everybody and provide all the social distancing we need. So I hope you'll take advantage of this. Stand with me if you would. Look around, smile. Now, the masks are off, you can smile, you know. I had to go in a drugstore yesterday and a lady nodded and I said, ma'am, I'm smiling under here. I promise you I am. It's nice to see everybody. Let's declare the word of the Lord before we sing to him. The psalmist said this, read it with me. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you who saints. There is no want in those who fear him. Have you tasted the Lord and you know he's good today? And you can trust him. Just take a minute. Come on, let's, let's just take a minute. We're always so rushed. Just take a minute and just, just talk to him. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness to us. For your mercy and your grace. We declare you are good and your mercy endures forever and ever. And Lord, in the midst of circumstances that have, they're not like anything we've ever seen, here's what we say. We still trust in you because you are still faithful and you are still God. And we sing to you from the depths of our heart because you are worthy. In Christ's name. The people of the Lord said, Amen. Amen. Let's shake the earth singing to him today. How many of you know our God is good today? Do you believe that? Come on, let's sing of his goodness today. Let's give him praise in this place. Lord God, we glorify you.
That's our story today, amen? That God in every situation has been good. There's never been a question, there's never been a doubt, and that no matter what the circumstances around us, we can trust that He is the cornerstone that we can stand firmly upon. Amen? Jesus, we thank you for that confidence today. That we can stand strong in that hope today. That you are always there. That you will never be shaken, God.
that moment when we will stand before the one who gave us life, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who took on flesh to die for your sins and my sins, the one who loved us so much he didn't turn his back, but he took on nails and scars for us. Are you thankful for that today? We can see him face to face one day. He is our cornerstone. Christ alone, He's the cornerstone, the weak made strong in the same. Come on, proclaim it through the storm. songs of praise to your name, Lord, that you have allowed us into your presence today, that you made a way, God. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. Amen. You may be seated, but please continue to worship with us.
Yes. Where the song goes on. He is the reason I sing. Amen. I'd rather have Jesus. Than anything. Amen. I'd rather. Have Jesus. Than silver. Or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I those nail-pierced hands than to be a king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sweat. Oh, I'd rather 
Jesus more than anything this world can afford today. Tag that last line with me. I'd rather have Jesus more than anything this world can afford today. Is that the way you feel? Just remain standing. You know, when, when you're young, the world looks pretty bright. The world has a lot of glimmer and glitz and what do they call it now, bling. When you live long enough, you figure it out, it's all fool's gold. And the only thing that matters is Jesus. Amen. Well, we're in Revelation chapter two. Thank you guys. I just wanted to sing with y'all. Y'all sounded so good and I just, you know, I don't pull rank often, but just every now and then is what it is. I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing. I would have sung. I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now, but I think they would have just killed over in the floor uh, if I'd have pulled that on them. So. But I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. I'm going to make it to heaven somehow. Hallelujah. Though the devil tempt me and tries to turn me around, I offer everything that's got a name, all the wealth I want, worldly fame. If I could, still I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Some of you don't know that song, that's okay. Those of us that do, we love it. The church at Thyatira, I went back to my Muppet days and entitled this, When the Fungus is Among Us. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 18. Read with me. And to the angel of the church at Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, your patience. And for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel. Everybody say Jezebel. Jezebel. Isn't that just fun to say? <laughs> you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I have given her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all of the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now, to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have until I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule over them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like potter's vessels. And I also have received from my Father, and I will give to him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so let us hear what the Spirit would say today for the glory of God. In Christ's name we ask it, amen. You may be seated. Look at your neighbor as if you think they have a fungus. <laughs> Mike, put your mask back on, I don't know. <sighs> I wanna take a minute this morning and just make sure we are aware of the context of the churches to whom Jesus is writing. When I, when I felt compelled to go into Revelation, I actually considered skipping over 
chapters 2 and 3 because everybody wants to get right now to the end times. Everybody, right? I mean, I'm getting all these hints about what I should preach about. Okay, preacher, don't forget to talk about the cashless society and the chips that Bill Gates is going to put in everybody. And if you take the vaccine for COVID, it's the mark of the beast. And so all the theories are out there and I'm getting inundated with those and I appreciate it very much. More than you know. But it does strike me that Revelation, which contains the epitome of the judgment of God on earth. Before he ever talks to the people of earth, he talks to the church. The Bible says judgment begins at the house of God. And so while we're worried about straightening out the world, Jesus is worried about straightening out the church. While we're worried about everything that's wrong with the world, Jesus' first priority is let's look at ourselves and see where we are. So we have to consider his word. The context is very interesting, though, because these early churches existed in the day and the realm of the Roman Empire. This is the governing authority in which they are under, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, known as both one of the greatest empires that has ever been and one of the most treacherous empires that has ever been. There were a lot of great things about the Roman Empire. Their their political structure was cutting edge, brand new, a a model that this country actually was founded somewhat on the model of the Roman Empire with the Senate and the President and, and the various branches of government. It was something really that was amazing. And then you look at the Roman and their engineering achievements. Rome is the government that built the roads that the apostles carried the Gospels on all around Europe and Asia. It was the roads the Romans built, the engineering feats of the Romans that allowed the gospel to spread so quickly in that day. And then military-wise, men still study the military campaigns of the Roman armies and and they still marvel at their works and their, their, their brilliance that was accomplished as they conquered other lands. Rome had a lot of things going for it. Rome was a... Uh, They didn't really have a deity per se. They worshiped a lot of gods. Pretty much anything goes. At the end of the day, they worship themselves. At the end of the day, they worship themselves. And in their worship of a lot of various gods, there are a lot of various forms of worship that took place, including strange sacrifices. And it was very common in the religious idols of that day that sexual immorality was just part of the religious experience. There were shrines that had shrine prostitutes that were there. It was just part of what took place as they worshiped their gods. Now, if you were Roman in that day, it was great. If you were not Roman, they'd kill you in a minute. They would kill you without cause and they would kill you without question. And I say all that for you to know, this is the backdrop out of which these churches existed. This is the darkness of the world out of which these seven churches are having to exist and having to operate. you got to remember, at this point in time, the gospel is only 100 years old. The gospel is brand new in the earth. Uh, On the religious radar, these churches were merely just a little blip that had just popped up. In the eyes of the Roman government, they called this a cult. They called the followers of Christ a cult. They called them people of strange belief. And I said all that to kind of bring it to where we are today. Because I'm of the opinion that the darkness that once was on the earth is returning to the earth at a very rapid pace. I'm of the opinion that the darkness that once was prominent throughout the earth is returning to the earth at a prominent pace. I'm of the opinion that men have reached a point that they don't care anymore. Is anybody hearing me? I'm of the opinion. You know, there might have been a time that we had a moral cloud over us that sort of kept us shielded from all of this. But the moral cloud is gone and immorality has vanished. And in its place, the darkness of the earth is sweeping across us. And thus the church has to decide who we are. Because in the eyes of the world, we are just like the church in the early days. We're just a cult. We're just people of strange beliefs. We're just odd and out of touch 
much and out of date and old timey and old fashioned and we are irrelevant and we're going to have to decide who are we going to believe? Who's, whose report are we going to accept? Where are we going to live? Are, are we going to accept a time that the world may consider us irrelevant but we're going to hold on to our message because we know in whom we have believed and we believe he's able to keep that that he's entrusted unto us. As it was, so it is. And darkness is rampant around us. And so what he says to them, he says to us. Amen. Now, the church at Thyatira, it's really interesting. It's different than all the other churches. We've looked at some churches and we looked at some great cities. Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos, and those are great cities. Two of them right on the ocean. Don't get any better than that. The other one at a, at a river nestled in the mountains. Is anybody with me? Temperature never got above 70 degrees. Sounds like heaven to me. I don't know if that's true, but that's why heaven would be in, in my mind, especially in August. But Thyatira is different. There's no prominence in Thyatira. There's no great claim to fame. There's no marble lining the streets. There's no great libraries. There's no great arenas. There's no great stadiums. As a matter of fact, Thyatira is little more than a blip on the side of the road. It's just a little town situated on the side of the road between Pergamon and Sardis. That's all it is. It, it, it is what the world would call today flyover country. It, it, it's it. It's flyover country. It's Pergamon's here, Sardis is here, and the rest of it don't matter. That, that, that's, that, Thyatira is a, it, it's akin to our textile communities. Is anybody old enough to remember textile towns? That the only reason they sprung up was because there was a mill there. There was a textile mill there. Generally, there was a river to drive, to drive the mill and power the mill, but, that, but that's it. The only thing Thy, Thyatira has going for it is they are a producer of purple dye that comes is derived from plant products, which was very different because most of the purple dye in that day was derived from things that came out of the ocean. But they had found a way to derive purple dye, which is very popular in the Roman Empire, out of plant products. And if you read Acts chapter 16, where Paul takes his trip to Philippi and he goes down by the river to pray, studying about that good old way, that's another song for another day, he goes down by the river to pray and he encounters a woman named Lydia who is a seller of purple cloth who comes from Thyatira. So now we know about Thyatira. But here's the part about Thyatira that got me excited because I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, Lord, I understand why you put a church at Ephesus. I understand why you put one at, at, at Pergamos. I understand why you put one at Smyrna. Who wouldn't want to live there? But Lord, why you won't put one in Thyatira? It's only 8,000 people and all they do is produce purple dye. It's just, it's just blue collar people, Lord. Why'd you put a church, why, why would you put a church there? Why would you put a church in flyover country? And the answer is very simple. Because God doesn't care about cities. He cares about people. At the end of the day, God doesn't care about the political structure and he doesn't care about the arts and the literature and all. What he cares about are the souls that are living in every city and every town. At the end of the day, that's his concern and that's his focus. Now that may not mean anything to you, but it, but, 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 but it sort of stoked my heart a little bit because walk with me. We live in an elitist time. When, when people are defining that the only people that matter are the people who live in certain towns, or have went to certain institutions of learning, Amen. or hold certain degrees, or run in certain circles, I wish somebody would help me, or have a certain political portfolio, that these are the only people that matter, and therefore theirs are the only voices that should be heard. And we live in a time when the elitism had gotten so strong that honestly, a lot of this country only cares about New York and Los Angeles, and they do call everything else flyover country. Amen. And they consider everybody who lives there flyover people. That the only people who matter are those of a certain pedigree and a certain place. Are you with me? You understand what that's when we're living in. And as I thought about that, I, I came to this other. I am so glad that God loves me just the way I am. 
I'm so glad that to God there is no flyover country, but everybody is important and everybody matters. I am so glad that God doesn't just care for those who live in certain cities and certain places and hold certain degrees from certain institutions, but I'm so glad that my Bible says, whosoever will may come unto the Lamb of God. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've been or what your degrees are or what they are. It doesn't matter if you are blue collar or white collar. It doesn't matter your political persuasion. None of those things are relevant in the eyes of the Lord. And the world may think we are insignificant. And the world may think we are flyover people. But sweetheart, I want to tell you something. He thought we were enough to die for. He thought we were enough to leave the throne of glory and put on robes of flesh and die a cruel heartless death that we might be reconciled and called the sons of God. And we may never be accepted in the eyes of the world. And we may never be acclaimed in the eyes of the elite. But I know one who knows my name and wrote it down in his book and sings songs over me every day. You can have the world as long as Jesus knows who I am. Then I can go on tomorrow. Amen. So to the angel of the church at Thyatira, he writes, and he says to them, he, 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 he begins with a compliment. He says, I know your works, I know your love, I know your service, I know your faith, I know your patience, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. The last are more than the first. Now, that's an amazing declaration. He's telling them, what you are doing for me now is more than what you were doing for me when you started. He knows, he doesn't say this to any other church. What you are doing for me now is more than what you were doing for me when you started. And he says this in a very complimentary fashion. You see, let me tell you why that strikes me. The human tendency is we tend to start well and finish poorly. The human tendency is we start well. The gun fires and we come out of the blocks wide open. But the closer you get to the finish line, the more you drag and slow down. And you may have started in a full sprint, but you'll wind up crawling at the end. Because human tendency is we start well and we slack off. Is anybody hearing me? That's across the spectrum. We start our diets well. Every Monday morning. This is it. Today's the day. Got it. Going to get a hold on this. It's going to be easy. I'm going to do this. Today's the day. This is it. And then we get out of bed. And we realize the devil put a Bojangles right around the corner. Now how are we going to diet when the devil's put a Bojangles right there? We start well, and we start with the best of intentions. But human tendency is we don't hold up very well. It's true with our diets. It's true with our workout programs. Watch gym memberships every January. And all the gym owners will tell you, don't worry about it. February will be here. They'll be gone. It's the same with finances. It's the same with business. We start well. It's the same with marriage. I don't know anyone who was married here thinking, already planning their divorce. We start well, but we fade as the journey goes. And it's the same with church and our service to the Lord. We start well, but give it time. And the human tendency is we back off. It's going to get quiet a little bit. We start with the best of intentions. And I, now after 25 plus years, I've seen the cycle. I know how it works. As long as we have children in children's church, we are volunteering in children's church. And then when they move to the youth group, the youth pastors have more volunteers than they've ever had. But then when the kids go off to college, oh, 
I got my time now. And for a while, we served so well. But then we back away. One must ask the question, since you're going to be quiet and make me mad. <laughs> One must ask the question, who were you serving? Your children or the Lord? We start singing in the choir well. But after we've sung in the choir a few years, we start serving the Lord well. When you first found the Lord, we couldn't get you not to come to church. When you first found the Lord, you'd out here in the parking lot when the doors were locked. People first find the Lord, they're so committed, I'm going to do so much. Give it time. And the people that you couldn't get not to come to church, you can't get to come to church. Because the human tendency is we start well, but we finish poorly. You want me to get off of this? It's truth. Jesus sees this church and he sees something in them that he does, hasn't seen in any other church. He says, I know your works, your service, your love, your faith. And here's what's amazing to me. You're doing more now than you did in the beginning. And you can hear him saying, this is good. You're different from everybody else. You are doing more now than you were when you first started. So th th this sort of begged the question that has to be asked today. Could that be said of us? Could it be said of me? And, 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 and I love the fact that Jesus doesn't say what the works are. Because here's the truth. The works for the Lord are going to change as life changes. As, you, as, as, as we go through seasons of life, the works do change. I understand that. But there still should be things we are doing that testify we love the Lord and are living for Him. And the question that must be asked is, am I doing as much today for the Lord as I was five years ago? Am I doing as much today for the Lord as I was 10 years ago, as I was 15 years ago? Do the works of my life testify that I am still as committed to Christ and His church as I was in previous seasons of my life? I'm going to let that sink. I was, uh, I was on a Zoom call with Church of God leadership and we were waiting on the, the, the thing to start and we were on there and Loran was on there and he said, well, guys, yesterday was our church's 43rd anniversary. We've been organized 43 years and I've pastored 43 years. And so I said, Loran, I'll ask you a question. What's the biggest change you've seen in 43 years? He did not hesitate. He did not blink. He said, loyalty. He said, when we first started, everybody was loyal and serving. And now they'll walk away in a skinny minute. Are we going to be the generation that started well and finished poorly? Selah. He commends them. You're doing more now than you were when you started. I don't know about you. I, well, we, we're here. We might as well just go all in. I don't want to finish poorly. I don't want to, I, I don't want to hobble across the finish line. Amen. Now, you can look and tell I ain't built for running. I, I, and, and, and I've enjoyed jogging, and we do these little jogs, and when Jan and I are doing them together, I'll kiss her at the start line and say, I'll see you at the finish. Not because I'm going to get there first. Oh, no. no. That ain't happening. And so I have my pace. Makes her so mad. Because I, will, I hit my pace and I don't change. I have this little cadence thing on my phone, you know, that tracks your cadence. You'd think I was dead. Straight to flat lines. But when I, when I see the finish line, I finish strong. When I see the end, I'll pick it up. I'll spot somebody in front of me who thought they were something when they passed me. 
I'll, I'll spot somebody in front of me who I know when they went past me, they were snickering, saying, what is this old man doing out here? And if we're near the finish line, honey, it is on. <laughs> and I'm going to finish at a full throttle. I want to finish my race for the Lord. Amen. Wide open. And I don't want it to be said, you did less in the end than you did in the beginning. Because that would imply somewhere I stopped believing in the end what I believed in the beginning. Can it be said of us that our works are what they once were? I'll get off of that. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Now, Jesus then goes into a concern. He says, but I have a concern about you because you have allowed that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants and commit sexual immorality and things offered to idols. He says, here's the problem that has crept into the church. Here's the fungus that is among you. You've allowed Jezebel to become influential among you. And in her influence, she is leading my servants away from the truth and leading them into lifestyles and down a path that is going to bring them into judgment and death and suffering. And listen to me again. He's talking to the church, not the world. He's talking to the church. Now, there are varying opinions as to whether or not Jezebel was a real person in the church or whether or not it was a spirit of Jezebel. And, and my belief is this, that it's a real person because he called her by name. Amen. He specifically called her by name. In another, in another two churches, he talked about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and that was kind of a broader scro scope. Here, he's specific. You let this Jezebel, I love saying that. Don't ever name your kid Jezebel. You let Jezebel, who has given herself the title of prophetess, has declared herself to be a prophetess, probably had it on her bus, engraved on the cape, written on all of her books, prophetess Jezebel, you are allowing her to teach my people and lead them away from the truth. Now, I immediately had two points spring up in my mind. One, to the church. You, we have to be careful who we allow to lead, speak, and become influential among us. The church has to guard who she lets become influential among them. Doesn't matter how many titles they have given themselves or how many titles they say others have given them. Before you give anyone a seat of influence, you need to judge the fruit of their life and see if the way they are living lines up with the word of God. Is anybody hearing me today? Because we are told the closer we get to the end, the more false prophets and false doctrines are going to arise. Now, I want to issue a word of warning. We judge by fruit, not by gifts. There are a lot of gifted people in the world. And there are a lot of gifted people in the church. There are people who have the gift of, who have gifts of knowledge and they're able to speak. There are people who have a charisma about them and, and people are drawn to them. And gifts are a wonderful thing when they are of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus never said you judge people by their gifts. Jesus said you will know them by their fruits. And I've lived long enough to realize gifts may spring up overnight, but it takes time to see the fruit, baby. You, and we have people come in all the time and they want to get right in the middle and become influential. And here's our reply. We're glad you're here and we'll welcome you to be here. But you're going to have to walk with us for a while and we're going to have to walk with you for a while because we want to know that your life lines up with what you're saying before we entrust our babies to you or our youth to you or someone else to you. We want to know that you know the Jesus that we know and you're living for him every day because you may be a nice person and a gifted person but those are a dime a dozen all I want influencing the people of God is someone who is living the life of God and it is testified by the fruit of their life now while that's true of the church that's true of you too you have to guard 
who is influencing your life. Because a lot of stuff sounds good, but ain't in the book. Is anybody hearing me today? I don't care how popular they are. I don't care how many degrees they have. Anyone who is not drawing you closer to Christ should never become an influence in your life. Are you hearing me? Anyone who is not drawing you closer to Christ, and I'm going to go one step further. Anyone who is leading you away from your relationship with Christ should be severed out of your life. Okay, I didn't have as many amens right there. Anyone who is leading you away from your relationship with Christ is operating as Jezebel operated. That's right. You can just call them, you're Jezebel. I don't care if it's your friends or if it's your boyfriend or if it's your girlfriend or if it's your business associates or if it's your neighbor. If their influence is leading you away from your relationship with Christ, then you need new influencers in your life. You're hearing me today. He was concerned. And then he calls out the compromise. Going to get quiet now. Help me, Lord. When you look at the history of this blue-collar town, this textile-type community that produced purple dye, they had operating among them trade guilds. Thyatira was known for trade guilds. The trade guilds were akin to unions or chambers of commerce. That if you were a part of the business clique, then you had a business. Does anybody hear me now? If you were a part of the guild, then you pretty well were assured of jobs and prosperity and your business was recognized. But if you were outside of the guild, then then the road was a lot harder. What Jezebel was teaching, oh, here's the problem with being part of the guild. If you were in the guild, you were expected to go along with the guild. When in Rome. And the guild would be known for idol worship like the whole city was known for. And so it would not be common within the guild for there to be common times of eating food, sacrificed to idols and even the opportunities for sexual immorality. And people were forced to make a decision. Jezebel has come into the church and basically said, it's okay. The Lord understands you got to make a living. And so it's okay for you to participate in food offered to idols and sexual immorality. Because, as they would say today, after all, it's just business. It's just business. That's the way business is. And so my point, I'm making a lot of quick, small points today. My point today is simply this. If your business requires you to compromise your Christian walk and testimony then you need a new business. If, you're, if, if, if you have to compromise who you are in Christ to be successful in business, then you need a new business. Because as a follower of Christ, our only business is to glorify Him. Amen. Amen. And, 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 and that just opens up a whole new door. And I go back. If your friends cause you to compromise your walk with Christ, you need new friends. If your boyfriend or girlfriend causes you to compromise your walk with Christ, assuming you're not married, you need a new boyfriend or girlfriend. Boy, it got quiet on me there. But I believe that's true. I got some kids going off to college. Listen to me. If your sorority or your fraternity causes you to compromise your walk and your life with Christ, then you need a new sorority or you need a new fraternity or you need no sorority and you need no fraternity. Maybe you just need to say, I am of the brotherhood and sisterhood of Christ. That's where I belong. 
People say today, and I've heard it countless times, well, preacher, it's just business. And that's what you have to do. Yeah, it's just business. That's what you have to do. Well, here's what I want to say in the words of my father, Tommy Rott. Yeah, when I tried to pull something over on him, he didn't buy it. That was what I would hear, Tommy Rott. And Tommy was my brother. I don't know why he threw that at me. <laughs> or occasionally, malarkey. Malarkey. It's just business. For, no, it's not. Let me tell you what it is. It's an excuse. It's an excuse for you to do something you want to do. To satisfy some desire that is in your flesh. And you are blaming it on your business or your friends or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whatever you say is influencing you. And all of that is malarkey. You make your own choices. And you can be the person you want to be. In the realm of business, yes, you may be exposed to things. But that doesn't mean you have to participate in them. Come on now. We're in the world. We're going to be exposed to some things. But that doesn't mean you have to participate in them. I spent over a decade, about 13 years with a real job before I started this life. And I know a little bit about it. I work for some of the most successful companies in this area. I know the pressure. I know what goes on in business. We would, but, but I also know if you draw the lines and say, this is who I am, they will accept you and not reject you. Every Monday morning, a, a crew and I would get on an Eastern airplane at the Greenville Spartanburg Airport. And some of you are so old, you are so young, Eastern, what is that? We would get on an Eastern airplane and every Monday we would fly to New York City and every Friday we would fly back home and Monday through Friday we were there, just us, living out of a hotel with a per diem and able to do anything we wanted to do at night. And they found out the first week where my lines were. They found them out so quickly that the second week they went to corporate and said, put the rental car in Madden's name. He's our designated driver. Because they knew there was a line and I wasn't going to cross it. Another corporate time, we were in Florida and they were whining and dining us literally. And we, as we were sitting there at this big table and this big spread, one of the executives with the, with, with the company who was hosting us said, okay, after dinner, we're going to go to such and such a place for entertainment. And one of the guys spoke up and said, we'll have to take Jerry back to the hotel first. And I said, yes, you will. Yes, you will. But 12 o'clock that night, there was a knock on my door and one of my associates who was drunk out of his mind was weeping and saying, would you pray for me? You don't have to cross the lines to be successful in business. You don't have to cross the lines to be successful at school. You don't have to cross the lines to be successful in your community. You can stand up and say, I am a blood-bought, born-again follower of Jesus Christ. And there are lines that I will not cross. There are things that I will not compromise on. I understand you make your choices, but I make my choices. And at the end of the day, while they may initially snicker and laugh, when it all comes crashing in, you'll be the one they come looking for, saying, I want to know the God that you know. And I want to have the hope that you have. What does it profit if you gain the whole world? What does it profit if you have the biggest business? What does it profit if you're the most popular boy or girl on campus? What does it profit if yours is the name that the whole world is proclaiming, but you lose your soul? And the translation of that question Jesus asked is, what will you trade your soul for? Amen. And there are people all around us trading their souls. People all around us trading their souls for drunkenness 
and revelry and sexual immorality. You're going to trade your soul for that. God help you. You don't have to do that. They compromised. There was a fungus among them. Jesus says, now I have given her time to repent. He goes on. I've given her time to repent. I've called to her to repent. And she would not repent. And so I'm going to cast her into a sick bed. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds, I'll kill her children with death. And all the churches will know, and I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I'll give each one according to your works. Listen to me. Without repentance, judgment comes. There's no other remedy. You either accept the judgment that Jesus bore on the cross at Calvary in confession and repentance or you will face your own judgment yourself. Amen. Without repentance, judgment is certain. But you hear the heart of Christ. He says, I've given her time to repent. I've reached out to her. I've given her opportunities. I've pointed out the error of her way. I've called her to turn from her wickedness. The mercy of God has been extended because at the end of the day, the Lord is long-suffering, not willing that anyone should perish. He's a lot more long-suffering than we are. We want to grab them by the nape of their neck and shake them real good. The Lord is long-suffering, patient, not willing that anyone should perish. So he's reached out to her time and time again. Brothers and sisters, no one is going to be able to point their finger in the face of God and say, you didn't give me a chance. No one will ever be able to point their fingers in his face and say, you didn't give me an opportunity. Romans 1 and 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, they've been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. They knew they were doing wrong. They just wouldn't repent. Now I want you to hear this because this is going to be a common theme as we go through Revelation. As the judgments of God start to be poured out on the earth in tribulation, Three times, here's what the scripture is going to say. But they would not repent. I'm talking about the seal, the trumpet, the bold judgments, the most horrible things the earth has ever seen. As these things are poured out on the earth, the prophecy is, but they would not repent. Pride and arrogance has affected man so strong that even in the harshest times, they will not repent. And I look at you today and I wonder if we are seeing the beginning of that now. As we see some of the darkest days the earth has, never seen, has ever seen, but there is no call for repentance. Jesus said, I, I gave her time and opportunity, but she would not repent. And so I will turn her over to judgment. Judgment here is listed as painful in her body and agonizing. He talks about the children. He's not talking about physical children. He's talking about those who have followed her doctrine. The children of her doctrine will be subject to the same judgment. Now, this could be a direct judgment that was sent by God, but... I would subscribe to the notion more often the judgment of God is simply the removal of his hand of mercy and letting our sins run their natural course. I hear people all the time, well, this is the judgment of God sent on men. Well, this is the judgment of God. Okay, maybe. But more often the judgment of God is simply God taking away his hand of mercy such that the sins of our lives run their natural course to destruction and calamity. Is anybody hearing me today? 
Anybody hearing what I'm saying? He, 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 when he talks about Jezebel, we know that one of the things she's promoting is sexual immorality. And then he says, I'm going to cast her onto a bed of suffering and pain. Now, I'm going to say something here, and I hope you'll bear with me. If you sleep with enough people, sooner or later, you're going to catch something. Hello? Should I have rated this sermon PG? That's the truth. Sooner or later, you're going to, something's going to get you. The judgment of God could have been nothing more than him removing a hand of mercy and letting the sexual sins of her life catch up with her and those who follow her. God doesn't have to send a plague to bring judgment. But if there's ever a day in our lives that we're not covered by his mercy, we'll feel like we're being judged. If there's ever a day in our lives we'll feel like that, that, that we're not covered by his grace, we will feel like judgment has come. He's allowing the sins to run their course. Pastor Bob, play softly, please. I see the look in their eyes. Preacher, it's an hour. Let's go. But then he gives words of comfort. Now I say to the rest of you, those are the best words I've heard. To the rest of you at Thyatira. And I'm reminded, he knows. In his omniscience, he knows who's following the way and who's not following the way. In his omniscience, he's able to separate the sheep from the goats. And now he turns from the goats and talks to the sheep. He says, now to the rest of you who haven't followed that doctrine and don't know the depths of Satan, I'm not going to put any more burden on you. But here's what I tell you. Hold fast until I come. Hang in there. Keep what you got. Hold fast until I come. And when I come, my reward will be with you. Hold fast. What, what's he saying? He's saying against the darkness of the world around you and against the plague that has broken out in the church, here's what you do. Hold what you got. Grab hold of Jesus like you've never grabbed hold of him before. Grab hold of Jesus like you've never held him before. Squeeze him harder than you've ever squeezed him before. Love him more than you've ever loved him before. Pour your heart out like you've never poured it out before. To the rest of you, hold fast to what you got because what you've got is enough to keep you regardless of what may happen around you. See, here's our problem. We ask this question all the time. How far can I go? That's a question you hear a lot in the church as we see the world. Well, how far can I go? And that's the wrong question. And we'll let you wind up in the wrong place. I can ask you today, will Wade Hampton Boulevard take me to Greenville? And everybody in here would say, yeah. That's the wrong question though. Because Wade Hampton Boulevard will also take me to Spartanburg. The question is not, how far can I go? That's what children ask. That's what teenagers ask. That's an immature question. The question isn't how far can I go? The question is, how close can I get to Jesus? How close can I get? him his remedy for the church was this just grab a hold of me like you've never grabbed a hold of me before just hold fast to me like you've never held fast to me before brothers and sisters if there's a message for the church today it is this 
The world has lost her mind. You better grab a hold of Jesus like you've never grabbed a hold of him before. The world has gone prolifically crazy. The world, and, and they don't care anymore. There's no morality and there's no standard and we have yet to see how depraved men and women are going to become. So what's the message to the church? You better grab hold of Jesus like you've never grabbed a hold of him before. And I'll go a little further. You better make sure your kids are grabbing a hold of Jesus like they've never grabbed a hold of him before. Because if it's a struggle for us, what's it going to be for them? It is no time, my God, for us to back away. It is no time for us to ease up. It is no time for us to coast in our relationship with Christ. There's opportunities for you to be involved in so many things, but nothing better come between you and Christ because when he comes, and he's coming soon. There may not be time to grab a hold of him then. You better grab a hold of him now. Stand with me. I wrote this statement. In a culture, and let me rephrase it. In our culture, that has lost its ever loving mind. The church better hold fast because he's the only hope we have. Amen. He's the only hope we got. I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. And I want us to let the word permeate our hearts this morning. And I'm going to walk you back through this very quickly. If the Lord were speaking to you today, would he be able to compliment you saying, you're doing more for me now than you used to. You're more committed to me than you were five, 10, 15 years ago. It's obvious to me your commitment to me has grown and not Diminish. Could, 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 could he say that to you? If not, it'd be a good day to repent. Would there be an area of your life that he would have concern? That you're letting people influence you who should not influence you? That you're letting voices lead you astray that should not lead you astray? Is there an area of your life where you've compromised? Well, 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 I know this is what the Bible says, but, you know, this is business, or this is school, or this is just the way, and this is the one I get. It, well, preacher, this is just the way things are today. It may be the way things are today, but the book's what I live by. Is there a place you've compromised? Has he spoken to you about your compromise, but you've not yielded, hence, Without repentance, there would be condemnation. And have you grown weary and almost wanted to give up? If so, here's what he says. Hold fast. I got you. I got you. Just as I am without one plea Let's all sing this with Pastor Bob this morning as a prayer. Just as I am and waiting not to read my soul of one dark blood to whose blood
Would you listen to me a minute? Give me just a minute. I didn't preach a sermon just to have a sermon to preach. As I've gone into these churches and looked, I've been amazed at the relevance. And, but when I got to Thyatira, my heart broke. Because this story isn't just real in their day. This story is real today. After growing up in a pastor's home and now over 25 years in ministry, I'm going to tell you something. I've watched over and over again as people compromise what they know is truth and justify it a thousand different ways. And you listen to your pastor this morning, I've never seen it turn out good. My kids going to college, whether you're watching online or whether you're here, don't you compromise. If you have to drop out, drop out, but don't you compromise. Brothers and sisters, these are the last days. Don't you compromise. You better grab hold of Jesus like you've never grabbed a hold of him before. And you better make sure that them babies are indoctrinated in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the only way they're going to be indoctrinated in it is if you indoctrinate them in them. You have to do it. You can't leave it to the pastor or the children's pastor or the youth pastor. We get an hour a week. It's not going to happen at school. It's not going to happen on the internet. You have to teach it and live it before their lies or else I'm afraid they may not have a chance. Lord, your word is powerful and it is true. And I'm so thankful for it. Now let it work in our lives. Lord, don't let this be a word that we hear and we feel a moment of conviction, but we walk out the door and the effect of it is gone. Please, Lord, let the word bring forth fruit and let it accomplish its work. Let men and women and boys and girls make conscientious decisions today that I will not compromise. I'll guard the influencers of my life because all I want to hear is Jesus' voice. Help us to hold fast to you as we never have before. And Lord, we sincerely pray as always, let the words of our mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Be careful. Mask up. Take precautions. We'll see you next time.